Final Fantasy Oregon Trail. <laughs> it's the next Final Fantasy coming up. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Today we're going to chat about some old games. Sort of talk about them more as the beginnings of franchises that we love. So we're going to talk about Final Fantasy 1 and 2 and Zelda 1 and 2. Since it came out first, let's start with Zelda. The original Zelda was kind of the perfect Zelda in many ways, in that it's a fairly open-ended, top-down adventure game with lots of swords and lots of cool other items that you can use on your quest. So the first Zelda doesn't have a ton of plot to it. It's just princess captured, need power to defeat Ganon, get pieces of Triforce, put them together, defeat Ganon. Stay away from the summoner. Right. The first Zelda was released in 87. Also released in 87, we've got the first Castlevania, Metroid, oh, and Mega Man. Okay, so a lot of franchises started in 87, but they feel similar in a lot of, a lot of ways and very different in other ways. Yeah, in some ways it feels like they're all just different recolorations and genres of one another. Like, you can definitely see the similarities between a game like Castlevania and Zelda, and even Metroid. They each have, like, a basic weapon, and then power-ups that you get along the way that you can switch between in most cases. But I think, like, the difference is how open-ended each of these games are. The least open-ended of them is the original Castlevania. It's not super open-ended. But Metroid, Zelda, and Mega Man have a lot of choice in what you can do from the start of the game. You can also really see how they were thinking from a marketing perspective, because if you like sci-fi, you go for Metroid, or maybe Mega Man, kind of. Uh, if you like horror, you go for Castlevania. If you like fantasy, you go for Zelda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so much fun how in 87 all of these franchises are starting, and they're all similar in many ways, but they have all these different flavors. They're looking at the, a similar game through all these different lenses. That is a really fun sort of thing. So, but being top-down, Zelda doesn't have um, the platforming that the other games do. And in general, most Zelda games don't have a ton of tricky platforming. Some do more than others, though. It does seem like a pretty hard game to me. <laughs> yeah, um, though it is not quite as hard as I remember. I have beaten it somewhat recently uh, without cheating at all. Um, and I, normally I'm pretty bad at most games. So if I can do it, then you can do it too. Um, it just, it took more patience than anything. So a lot of the things that are in the first Zelda that are in most, if not all of the rest, um, you start right off with a wooden sword. You're starting off with a weaker sword than you end up with. It's something that happens in a lot of the Zelda games. Rupees are a thing, the boomerang, bow and arrow, bombs, yeah, you know, all, all the stuff that we're used to seeing. It was also cool to see all the original designs of the monsters that would later be seen in like, uh, my first Zelda I played was Ocarina of Time. And I've played others. I've played Link's Awakening, obviously the Oracle of Ages and Seasons and others as well. Um, but it was cool to see like the 8-bit versions of like Octoroks and uh, Tektites, is that their mm -hmm. name? Okay, mm -hmm. Tektites, yes. And Moblins and Zora. Not too much else that I wanted to say about Zelda, I don't think. Let's move into Zelda 2 now. So Zelda 2 is sort of the black sheep of the Zelda family. It's the only one that is a side-scrolling game, and it has a world map with somewhat random encounters. It's the most platforming happy Zelda game. Oh, it's got the level up system with experience points. A lot of people hate everything that I just said, but I kind of love it. With that exception of that, well, even with that game, there's always this progression in Zelda games of go to dungeon, get key item, kill the guy, go to next dungeon, rinse, repeat. And each item grants you access to a new area. And I've always felt that even though in some ways I guess it's more realistic that way, in other ways it feels like a really overwrought version of experience points, mm -hmm. right? It's just a different format for character progression. 
and it feels a little gimmicky to me sometimes, especially when you see, like, you were saying one strategy in Zelda 2 is to uh, not beat the dungeon bosses and just get the fucking item and then go to the next dungeon. Or, like, you see those speed runs of Ocarina of Time that cheese the hell out of the game by, like, skipping entire areas because you got the one thing you needed. Whereas, like, in the level up system with Final Fantasy games and other RPGs like that, it's much harder to do that. Like, if you go to a really high level and you're too low level for that area, you're fucked. Yeah. Uh, and you technically can also cheese it by grinding, but that's a big time investment. Yeah. It's really telling how little storage space these systems have, that in most cases for these early games, you're given the main premise of the plot in like a Star Wars style scrolling text instead of like, Go talk to this one NPC and they give you some of the information, but not all of it. Go talk to this other NPC and you get more exposition. It's much less graceful that way. But I loved the music in both. <laughs> um, I mean, it sounded nice. The art style was, I mean, it was fine. I think for the time it was made, it, it's good. I will say I don't think I liked the music in Zelda 2 as much as you did. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't hate either soundtrack. It, the music in Zelda 2 is, is much more bleepy and bloopy. Of course, the original Zelda score is iconic, and that theme was used in all the other ones, so, yeah. Yeah, you can see a lot of the roots of the series in a cool way in these older games, in the music, in the art, in the like enemy design, the item design. So, talking about Final Fantasy, I have played some Final Fantasy 1, and I didn't really love it, to be totally honest. A lot of the characters feel really cardboard cut out. They feel like they have maybe one character trait, maybe two. Frankly, I found the gameplay kind of infuriating. <laughs> it was really difficult. It felt like I wasn't given a whole lot of tools, if any, to handle most of the problems thrown my way. It was cool to see things like the job system, and I get what they were going for with like the whole pick your class, pick your character's name, and all that stuff, but like, I, I could care less about saving Sarah. Yeah. I'm sure she's lovely. I don't know anything about her. Right. And in, like, the cohesiveness of the world, like Final Fantasy I is still, like, mostly medieval with some steampunk. Um, but then, then there's, like, random robots and time travel. Not that I feel like they detract, but I feel like they could be explained better. But still, like, the story is weak enough overall that it's, it's not compelling me to keep going, as most of the Final Fantasies do. Also, it's so grindy. Same with any NES JRPG. Like, the original Dragon Quests on NES are just incredibly grindy. That's why I think that, especially when they're on sale, the remasters of all these old games are often more worth it than they seem, at least if you know you like the game already. Because, like, I can't tell you how luxurious it was to have a fast speed version of Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah. Like, to be able to draw all that magic from enemies fat, like at four times the speed right. was so nice. I can't imagine that I'd ever be able to finish Final Fantasy I without one of those high speed things. Yeah. I mean, I, I did beat Final Fantasy I recently, um, but I cheated with Game Shark Code. The thing about Final Fantasy I on the PlayStation is that it has an easy mode, which I feel like, honestly, is kind of absolutely necessary. Because otherwise, you have to like go fight one battle and then go heal, then fight one battle and then go heal. Do you get any reward for doing the hard mode? You know, the non-easy mode, whatever you want to call it? Not that I know of. I do think there's a comfort to the repetitiveness of grinding in the same way of like watching a rerun of a show you like. Like, you know it's predictable. But my issue with it is it's really no indicator of like your skill as a player or your tactics or what you've learned. In these old school games, you can just grind your way to the top. Although honestly, that's kind of why I play JRPGs more than any other game, because they don't take a lot of skill. I mean, especially with like hand-eye coordination and quick reaction speed, that's the stuff that like, if I don't have it fairly quickly, I get frustrated and I don't want to play the game anymore. It's funny that we're talking about Zelda and Final Fantasy in the same video because the kinds of skills these games require are very different. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's one reason why I don't like side scrollers and why I'm not sure I would enjoy Zelda 2 because of the hand eye coordination thing. Whereas, like, the skill required that I'm talking about for FF12, or really most of the Final Fantasy games, isn't really so much hand eye coordination. It's like good planning, good strategy, and it's yeah. the type of skill that benefits from taking time and not rushing and not feeling rushed. So let's talk about the things that are in the first Final Fantasy. Ramin took some notes when he was watching me play. A lot of the music that comes in the first first Final Fantasy game sticks around in other Final Fantasy games, like the, the, the Crystal Prologue and the fanfare that in the first Final Fantasy game you hear when you cross the bridge shows up in many other Final Fantasy games. Also, the victory fanfare at the end of a battle is the same from Final Fantasies 1 through 6, as far as I know. Having Warriors of Light and Crystals motif is common in most Final Fantasy games in one way or another, even if it's sometimes more symbolic. I think we can sort of stretch Warriors of Light to be like destined heroes instead. In many of the Final Fantasy games, they're sort of destined in a way. I do think, and I might be biased here, that Final Fantasy XIII is some, has some interesting subversions of the trope, like people are turned into crystals when they don't do their destiny, or like the main hero, her nickname is Light. So the spells in Final Fantasy I, you purchase the spells, in, Final, in both Final Fantasies I and II, uh, you purchase the spells, and in Final Fantasy I you have different levels of spells, and you can fit slot three spells in each level that, you know, You've got a a dozen or so spells that are level one white magic spells, for example, and you can slot three of them on your white mage. Part of the strategy of the game is picking which three spells you really want, and then you've instead of having MP, you've got spell charges. You've got a certain number of times you can cast a level one spell before you need to replenish your spell charges. Which is a pretty direct reference to Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. When we get to Final Fantasy II, we get rid of spell charges and move to MP for the first time. But we'll come back to that. Yeah. Another interesting thing about this game is how uh, important status effects are. There's a period of really most of Final Fantasy as a series where status effects aren't important just because most bosses are immune to most of them. After like these early games, the first game I can think of where it becomes an issue again is 12. And status effects can be really de debilitating. And that's another actually hearkening to D&D. Especially for higher level characters, one of the easiest ways to increase difficulty of an encounter is status effects. Because in a battle of attrition where it's just your HP slash damage versus mine, Typically higher level characters, at least in D&D, will win it out. And I also think status effects make things more interesting. Really, this is true of almost all RPG, console RPGs of this generation. There's a really high encounter rate. In Frustratingly this game. high. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. a fan. So the, the last thing that uh, we have written about Final Fantasy 1 is the, the Four Fiends, which are basically the main point of this game in some ways, because you spend the largest portion of the game hunting down the four fiends. And they're really annoying fights. <laughs> yeah. There's this really interesting video from Final Fantasy Union uh, talking about the, the evolution of the four fiends and where it comes from in, I believe it's Chinese mythology, but I'm not positive about that. So I'll link to that video in the description as well, because it's, it's, it's a really good one. In conclusion, there is no Final Fantasy I in team. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy II, similar to Zelda II, is kind of the black sheep of the family. It's many people's least favorite, but I think I might actually like it more than Final Fantasy I overall. But it is a very frustrating game. What edges it up a little bit for me is all the little things that it does right. The main thing that I find really exciting about, about Final Fantasy II is how it actually has a real story. It has characters that have personalities. The main party, not so much so, but many of the side characters and temporary party members 
have some real personality to them, which I really appreciate. FF2 is actually a game I've always kind of wanted to play compared to the others. And, you know, you say it's the black sheep of the series. I'm not sure that I'd agree anymore. I think until FF11, I would agree. But FF11, because it was apparently, and I've never played FF11, but was apparently super buggy, um, had a really bad rap. FF13, I would also say, is a black sheep. I think uh, Final Fantasy XIII has more like ardent supporters than Final Fantasy II does, though. I think that has more to do with the fact that it's a more recent game. Than, it might be, yeah. yeah. The things that Final Fantasy II does completely differently compared to Final Fantasy I are very similar to the things that Zelda II does differently compared to Final Fantasy I. So we've got a different like mode of play. So Zelda I, top-down adventure game with no platforming. Zelda 2 side-scrolling adventure game with platforming. And leveling. And leveling. Final Fantasy 1 has a traditional, what we expect as traditional JRPG leveling system. Final Fantasy 2 does not. Instead of leveling up your characters in levels where each stat goes up by a predetermined amount, you level up individual stats. To do that, you do the thing that is related to that stat. If you want your strength stat to go up, you attack often in battle. If you want your hit points or your defense to go up, you get attacked. Uh, If you want your magic stats to go up, you cast magic. Everything has its own leveling system. Each character has a sword level, a shield level, an axe level, a staff level, an, an unarmed level, and each spell has its own level within that character. So I actually think, though, that's more realistic than it sounds. If you wanted to get stronger without endangering yourselves, you would spar together, you would fight each other. That makes a lot more sense in many ways. Um, And yes, it's more frustrating, but real life training can be more frustrating than a video game. Yeah, because if you you think about it, it it is kind of weird that if you spend a couple hours grinding and every character only attacks, their magic stats shouldn't go up. But in most JRPGs, that's what happens. The other thing that I really like about Final Fantasy II is the way it uses uh, keywords in the plot. So many characters can say a keyword to your party when you're speaking with them, and that word will be highlighted in red, which lets you, the player, know you can memorize that term, and then either ask that character or ask other characters about that term. A similar thing happens when you get certain key items. Like early in the game, uh, I didn't show Ramin far enough to see this, but you sneak back into your hometown and you find like the last sympathetic person to the rebel army who's left alive, who leads you to an injured person that he's been trying to nurse back to health. That injured person turns out to be a prince, and I can't remember the prince's name, but it's Prince Gordon's brother. He gives you a ring which you then can take back and show to Prince Gordon, and which makes Gordon feel shitty about himself, basically. And then you can show it to Princess Hilda, who says like, oh, you went all th- through all the trouble to get this. Maybe we can trust you with things that will help us. We can give you some missions to support the rebel army. Speaking of missions, that was one thing I really preferred about FF2 is the way that you got missions and the importance they had to the plot. There's this thing that happens in D&D games where either your characters have like a direct connection to what's happening in the world and therefore a reason to give a shit about insert task here that they're supposed to do, or you're a bunch of mercenaries and we just are telling you about this quest and you're just gonna go do it. And to me, that's the biggest difference between the way FF1 works and the way FF2 works. Is like, from the, right from the get-go in FF1, it's like, hey, Princess Sarah needs saving. And it's like, who is Princess Sarah? Why should I give a shit? And the game never answers this, other than the fact that I'm assuming you're a good person. <laughs> yeah. And you care when people are in danger, uh, even though there's probably a million people in danger in this world who are not a princess. Uh, but in FF2, it's like, from the get-go, your character has a direct connection to everything going on. You have a very good reason to give a shit. You know, your hometown is destroyed. You're helping the rebel army. And, I mean, this happens in D&D games a lot, too, where it's like, 
it's it often separates the wheat from the chaff with DMs of like, I'm giving you this quest because you want money, right? And it's like, <laughs> maybe I don't, you know? And then yeah. you're up shit creek without a paddle. That's one thing that makes me really want to play FF2 compared to FF1. It's just impossible if you're paying attention to not see why your characters would care. I'm not saying you as the player have to care. I don't know you like that. I wrote down high stakes plot. The plot feels much more high stakes, much more urgent, much more important. You know, like, I was watching you play FF1 and remembering that scene where they're like, the four warriors of light then went on a quest th to shatter the darkness and bring the light of peace back to the world. And I actually had a moment where I was like, the light of peace is gone? Yeah. Where did it go? I, I had no idea there was a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, like, as you continue through Final Fantasy 1, you realize, you learn that the four fiends have been corrupting the four crystals. You know, lich corrupting the crystal of earth means that, like, it's turning to, like, barren land around it, stuff like that. So there is, there are some more sticks that appear in Final Fantasy 1, but they do feel like, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> right. Whereas, like, by comparison, FF4 does a very similar mechanic of, like, the crystals affecting the natural world, but it does a much better job of warning you about it in advance, of gradually giving you that information. It reels you into the plot better than, like, you know, if the Earth is this fucked up from the Earth crystal, why do I start in, like, the most green, verdant environment imaginable? Like, a, a castle surrounded by forestry. The OST is also there in us. Yeah, That's through through both games. I did own Final Fantasy on my original Nintendo. It's been at least 20 years since I've played it, so I don't really remember it that well. But um, I do have them both through the Final Fantasy Oregon... Oh, Oregon's. Final Fantasy Oregon Trail. <laughs> it's the next Final Fantasy coming up. Yeah. No, I, I do have both of them through the Final Fantasy Origins disc that came out for the PlayStation 1. And so they have updated graphics and upgraded um, sounds for uh, the music. So it's it's kind of hard to completely compare, especially in these two terms. But we can look at compositions as compositions go. And Uematsu knows what he's doing and can write a dang good tune. And even though several of the harmonizations, I feel, in these earlier scores are a little expected and cheesy. He also didn't have as many things he could work with. You've got like, you've got this line of bleeps, this line of blips, and this line of bloops, and like you, you've only got those. So, Make it work, Noby. Yeah, basically. So, uh, so he did a really fantastic job, and he is rightfully considered one of the best video game composers. The other thing that I wanted to talk about with Final Fantasy II is character death. To many people, the death of Aerith in Final Fantasy VII is incredibly shocking, to the point that it's now a meme. People who have never played a Final Fantasy know that Aerith dies. And it's such a shocking moment, and it's like, oh, that character that, I was, that was in my party is now dead. Final Fantasy II. Every single guest party member but one, I believe, dies. Oh, wait, no, Layla lives as well. Okay, so... Many of the non-main party guest player characters dies in this game. So they don't pull the same weight that character deaths draw out of the player in later games. Character deaths have a long history all the way back to Final Fantasy II. I do like how in Final Fantasy II the guest party characters all have pretty described roles for them already when they show up. So for instance, when you get Joseph, like it's not worth trying to teach him a whole bunch of magic. Now he's he's a brawler, he's a bruiser. He uses his fists best. Just let him punch things. <laughs> Final thoughts on these early beginnings to franchises that have a long and well-loved history. Furion is a way cooler name than Cloud. <laughs> Suck it, Final Fantasy VII stands. You know Cloud is a dumb name. Stop it. Stop it. You know I'm right. Stop. Stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs>
Squall is also a dumb name. Lightning, and I say this as someone who loves Final Fantasy XIII and loves Lightning, is a dumb name. Yes. Stop it. Stop it. Although, are they better than butts? <laughs> Nothing's better than butts. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting how both of these franchises have second games that are among the most different from everything around it. Yeah, it's interesting that they tried to break the mold that quickly. I like how both of these franchises stick to some tropes and ideas throughout all of the games, though. Like, all of the various items in Zelda games and the overarching themes in Final Fantasy games. Characters named Sid, among which the first appears in Final Fantasy II. Also, like, credit where credit is due. It's hard to think of another game series at that level that has the variance in it that Final Fantasy and Zelda do. Yeah. Um, I would say, I would argue Final Fantasy more so, but Zelda has it too. But how wild is it that we're talking about these games that are older than him, <laughs> that still have this staying power through, yeah. throughout, like we're still talking about them in 2021. There's also something to be said about like, in a game like FF2, how they really have to rely on all these minute details to make it interesting in a way that not that some other Final Fantasies don't later on in the series. Not all, but some other Final Fantasies don't really delve so deeply into like the emotion of what's going on or the ramifications of what's going on. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Okay. For a while, I was trying to make our like end cap thing that we just give a random compliment to people. But since I have quit teaching, I'm kind of feeling that I miss the thing that I said at the end of every class I taught. So I would like to start saying that as part of our Remichael videos instead, which is maintain your gooey selves. Stop it. Stop it. You know I'm right. Stop. 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 <laughs>